Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Brother Allen. Thank you, Winona, for leading us during that time. We sure appreciate y'all. If you would, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. And uh, we've actually read this several times now, but maybe if I just keep preaching over it enough, we'll all have it memorized. Uh, last week, we did a sermon over the Bible Simplified. I, I presented to you the, the case that contrary to a lot of common practice, a lot of recommendations from seminaries, preachers, commentaries, things like that, we don't need to place a burden upon ourselves to try to find some deep spiritual meaning, uh, something that's kind of hidden, maybe beneath the surface that we have to decipher, decode. We don't have to do that in every passage of the Bible. If I read in the book of Judges about Samson's strength being lost when he cut his hair, I don't necessarily have to try to do some deep dive spiritual meaning behind what is the equivalent for me? If my wife was to cut my hair, what would happen to my strength? No, I, I don't have to do that. I take it in context. Samson was Samson. Samson was called as a judge, given responsibility. And I understand that the story of Samson is about Samson. And I don't have to try to find application in passages that are not about me. That doesn't mean I can't find wisdom in it. That doesn't mean that I can't find some indirect wisdom, guidance, instruction there. But at the end of the day, let's let the Bible just speak for itself. Let's not make it overcomplicated. The parts that are for me concerning the body of Christ, salvation by grace through faith, I'll take that. I'll run with it. And those that are about the nation of Israel, concerning the law, concerning those things, I keep them in their proper context. And uh, so I don't try to shoehorn in application where it doesn't belong. And so kind of look at this sermon today as a part two. So if, if, if last Sunday was the Bible simplified, today we're going to be talking about discerning between prophecy and mystery. In the Bible we have different categories of, of information, writing, instruction, scripture. And some of this is prophetic, foretelling of things through the prophets in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament as well. And we also have something that is called mystery. And it just so happens our sermon series has been the mystery of Christ. And that is this salvation that you and I have today, where we live in an age where man can come to God not by works of the law, not by being Jewish, not by any other method than simply trusting in Christ's shed blood, His death, His burial, His resurrection. And uh, so with that being said, that's where we're going to go from today. As a matter of fact, we are closing in on the end of our Mystery of Christ series. We have about, counting this one, four sessions left. That will leave us a nice ten number. I like ten. Nice round uh, nice round number to stop at. So uh, I think that you're getting the point across and we'll be ready to move on to more challenges, new things. But with that being said, if you would, let's stand in honor of reading God's Word. And we're going to read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And the Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles... If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of His promise in Christ by the Gospel. Lord, we thank You for this time that we have to study Your Word. We always thank You, Lord, that You've provided it for us, for our understanding, for us to be instructed in how You have worked in the past, what You're doing today, and what You will do in the future. Lord, I thank You for uh, this Word of truth. I pray, as always, we would follow Paul's instruction in 2 Timothy 2.15 to rightly divide it. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated this morning. So, in light of recent events, obviously, we've, we've all heard about, we've kept an eye on what's going on in the Middle East concerning Israel, concerning, concerning the Gaza Strip and all of these things. And whenever we have unrest in the world, but especially unrest concerning the Holy Land, this is the land where our Savior, Jesus Christ, walked. His feet were on the ground in Jerusalem, in Galilee, in Samaria. <clears throat> and so whenever we see these, these events unfold, it does cause us to kind of reflect on 
what, what do we think about these matters? Our understanding of the end times. When is that going to come? When is Christ going to return? When are the matters of the tribulation, the Antichrist? All of these things unfold. It kind of asks us as a Christian, what is our view on the nation of Israel, at least as it stands today? How should we stand concerning the nation of Israel? What are our, what's our obligations? Do we have obligations concerning these matters? And it also just asks us, it begs the question, what does the future hold? And with that being said, I want us to look at Scripture, in light of Scripture, with our revelation given to us, how should Christians approach these things? How should we view the world? How should we view Israel? How should we view the end times? What do we need to be worried about? What do we need to be concerned with? And, and I fully believe, thankfully, God has provided us the answers. I, I will fully affirm that the Bible contains the answers to these questions. I think that there's been a lack of diligence within men standing behind the pulpit preaching from the Bible. There has been a lack of diligence to really study it. And they have failed a lot of churches because they will not give straight answers. And maybe that's because they don't think the Bible gives straight answers. Maybe it seems like it's too big of a task, too challenging to take a hard stance on something. Maybe they're afraid of being wrong. I've been wrong lots of times, so I'm not afraid of being wrong. Uh, but I feel very confident to you today that what I'm going to preach to you is straight from the Bible because, once again, we don't complicate the Bible. We make the Bible simple because we take it literally for what it says. So today, I'm going to preach to you and explain to you that God has given us the answers to these questions. We understand what God is going to do in the end times. We understand what God's doing today. And we understand what God's going to do with the nation of Israel and what He's doing with Israel right now. We're going to answer all those questions. And hopefully, by the time we're done, I will be able to give you some peace of mind. Now, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, we need to look at these verses because this is really the the predicate for, for us to get this right, for us to get biblical prophecy, to get the dispensations correctly. As you know, the word dispensation is house rules. This is a word that's used in the King James. If you don't have a Bible that says dispensation, that's because it's not a King James Bible. Um, with that being said, Paul says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If ye have heard of the dispensation of grace, of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or once again, I've said this time and time again in this series, Paul received a revelation concerning a dispensation of grace. This was a new way that God was going to be dealing with humanity. In previous times, you can look at Israel, the Old Testament law, the obligations that they had. If Israel needed if Israel wanted to be in right standing with God, they needed to keep the law. And if they fell, they fell short, there was a sacrificial system. If you wanted to be in right standing with God and you were not an Israelite, you better convert to an Israelite real quick um, and, and get in right standing with the Lord. And so those were the requirements then. But you and I today, Paul says, no, no, no. We don't live under that law age anymore. We don't live under this national Israel covenant. We live in an age in which... Any man, any woman, any boy, any girl can come to be reconciled with God, not through the law, not through Israel, but what Christ has done for us. His shed blood, His death, His burial, His resurrection. And so this is the age that you and I live in today. This is our dispensation. We live in a dispensation of grace. So if we if we've put the history of the world out on the table and we drew it on a map, you and I, we would be landing in the timeline of the dispensation of grace. It's not the dispensation of the law. It's also not the end times. It's the dispensation of grace. Now, there's also another very important part about this dispensation that we need to understand. If, and if we overlook this, what Paul's about to say here, if we misunderstand it, if we, if we, if we don't grasp what Paul is trying to tell us, you are going to approach the Bible and you're going to get very confused very quickly. You're going to get a lot of what really seems to be conflicting information from the Bible itself. And it's very easy to fall into just complete confusion about these things. So verses 3 through 6, Paul says this, How that by revelation, so this dispensation of grace, 
Paul received this by direct revelation. This was not taught to him by Peter. This was not taught to him by John. This was taught to him by Jesus. God himself gave Paul this revelation. He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four in few words. Paul references a letter that we don't have uh, that he had previously written to Ephesus. Possibly he could be referencing maybe an earlier letter that was just written to other churches. The point is, as Paul said, I've talked about this mystery before. I'm explaining to you right now. He has made known unto me the mystery. That word mystery means mystery, secret, not known. It was hidden. Whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul says, I have a knowledge and understanding of this mystery concerning Jesus Christ. Verse 5, he says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. That's a big statement right there. And once again, I'm telling you, if you don't understand this part about the dispensation of grace, you're really going to struggle in understanding your Bible. This age that we live in was a secret. It was a mystery. It was not previously known. And whenever it says the Son of Men there, we we really need to consider that and and think about the ramifications of, of what Paul is saying and how that impacts us. He goes on and says, as it is now revealed. So Paul says, my time, I've received this revelation. It's now been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this revelation, this dispensation of grace that you and I live in today It was not known previously and has now been revealed. And Paul just clarifies, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, um, I lost my place, and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So that's, that's that's our dispensation. That's the mystery that the Gentiles, being the nations, anybody can be fellow heirs and partakers of Jesus Christ by the gospel that Paul was preaching. Once again, not of a matter concerning Israel, not concerning the Jewish covenants, the requirements, any of those things. It's by what Christ has done and accessed by grace through faith. This is the revelation that Paul received. And it had been hidden from the very beginning. Paul says in Revelation, or sorry, Romans chapter 3, verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, this mystery, this age that you and I live in. And look at what he says. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. So I want you to follow along with me here. This dispensation that you and I have today, it was hidden in God from the beginning of the world. This means that it was not known by the sons of men. And I, I'm repeating myself, but I'm trying to get my point across here. Let me, let me try to help make this point. Since the, the mystery was hidden in God and was not known in previous ages, that means that men did not know it. All right, and you I have it in your notes. It says, read, it, read that again. If the mystery was hidden in previous ages, it means that men did not know it. This includes the Old Testament prophets. If it was a mystery, if it was a secret, if it was hidden, the Old Testament prophets were not aware that one day God was going to offer a salvation by grace through faith not of works, lest anyone should boast. This also meant while Christ was on earth, we can read in Romans chapter 15, verse 8, Christ our Savior who died for our sins, He was on the earth focused to who? Not to the body of Christ, but to the Jewish people concerning the promises of the kingdom. Romans 15, 8 says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, for the truth of God. The circumcision is not you and I. Our, our circumcision that Paul talks about is a spiritual one. But in the context here of Romans, he's talking about the nation of Israel. And he was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. The fathers being 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, you can just go on and on. So Christ, while he was on the earth during his earthly ministry, he was preaching, remember, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He gave his parables, for the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is this. And, and as it goes on, and that kingdom of heaven is a very literal kingdom that's going to come down from heaven to earth one day where Christ will reign on the throne physically. All right, make no mistake. Let me get my orientation here. Okay, I'm facing south. If you go that, I guess if you go far enough either direction. But one of these days, Christ is going to be reigning on the throne. Okay, just go a few miles, hit some water, keep going, go a little bit further, and He will be there. His feet will be on the earth. His, he, he's going to land on the Mount of Olives, and He's going to enter in through the east gate of the temple, and He's going to reign as King. Okay, so whenever Jesus taught about these things, that's what He was speaking of. And this makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because while Jesus was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, He hadn't been crucified, He hadn't been buried, He hadn't been resurrected. These things hadn't taken place. My, in mine and your entire, or I guess yours and mine to be grammatically correct, entire salvation is focused, built upon Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So how can He be preaching something that had not yet come to fruition or even been revealed yet by the prophets. Paul said, I received this revelation after these things took place. And so, with that being said, at this point, the, the dispensation of grace had still been a mystery. It was still not known to men. It was only after Jesus accomplished these things and after He defeated death. He is the firstborn of all resurrection. No, it's because of Christ's defeat of death and His resurrection that you and I have a hope of resurrection. How could we have a hope of resurrection before Christ Himself came and defeated sin and defeated death and rose again? So all this is built upon what Christ has accomplished. So with that being said, if Paul was truly given revelation by God and Peter and the apostles believed he did. You can read, um, Devin mentioned it today in our Sunday school class. Peter affirmed Paul had a special revelation from God. Something different from what we had. While we were proclaiming the kingdom and to the Jewish people that we killed our Messiah, you can read in Acts 2, that's exactly what Peter did. He gets up before all of them and says, we killed the wrong guy because he was everything he said he was. Paul, but Peter said, no, Paul, you have a special ministry. And you need to go, just as we are ministering to the circumcision, to the Jewish people, you need to go and you need to take this to all nations concerning this mystery gospel that has now been revealed that God is doing something outside of the Jewish covenants. And it's all by grace through faith. So if Paul truly received that mystery, we've got to take him at his word. We cannot read Ephesians chapter 3 and say, well, it was a mystery to Paul. Paul didn't understand. That's why, that's why he called it a mystery. Or, well, Paul's saying some people didn't understand it. That's why it's a mystery. No, that's completely ignoring what Scripture says. It was a mystery not known to the sons of men. Who are the sons of men? That includes Isaiah, Jeremiah, and you can just go on and on and on. Malachi, Haggai, you just fill in the list. Hosea, these men, the sons of men, did not know. We're, we're going to talk about eventually Daniel's 70 weeks of prophecy. I'm already getting my Sunday school class geared up. If you do not insert a mystery age into Daniel's prophecy... The Bible's not true. It's incorrect if you do not understand that there is a mystery age that takes place. Understanding what God is doing today and how it was not known in previous generations is the key for us to stand on the Word of God and understand everything is going exactly the way God has promised and exactly as He has revealed to us. It is absolutely true. Daniel's 70 weeks of years prophecy is completely correct. It's just that some people don't understand that we live in a time that was not foreseen in the previous ages. Now, with that being said, not everything in the Bible is a mystery, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like all throughout the Bible. It's just a new, one new mystery after another being revealed over and over as a matter of fact, the vast majority of the Bible falls into a different category of revelation. 
And this is not a mystery revelation, but a, prof a prophetic revelation. It's prophecy. And that's what our sermon today is. We're discerning between what is prophecy versus what is mystery. Now, prophecy is the foretelling of future events. And that's what it is. Uh, in kind of modern times, sometimes preachers have liked to... What's the word I want to use? Kind of play with that word a little bit, prophecy. I've even heard some preachers say that they have the gift of prophecy because they preach. And I'm thinking that's not at all what prophecy means. Prophecy, according to Scripture, is preaching, proclaiming a foretold future event that was given by divine revelation. The prophets proclaimed future events because God gave them special, supernatural knowledge. And you can see so many examples of prophecy uh, of these things. If you go to Genesis 3.15, after the fall, God said to the serpent, the seed of woman is going to crush you on the head. That is the first prophecy of Christ, the Son of God having victory over Satan. That is prophetic. I mean, that's, uh, we're going on now some 6,000 plus years since that prophecy was given. It hasn't happened entirely yet, but rest assured, it will. God prophesied it would. He promised it would. You also have the prophecy of the, the Christ, the, the Savior to come, in that very same thing. The seed of woman, he's going to defeat you. Guess what? You, uh, you may bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. So we have, the, in Genesis 3.15, we have the prophecy of Satan's defeat and God restoring the earth. Christ coming. These things are prophetic. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, God foretold the flood to Noah 120 years before it came. So we can't look back and say, well, Satan's defeat, that was, that's mystery. We didn't know that Satan was going to be defeated. No, absolutely not. It, it, it's already been revealed. It was prophetic. We've known all this time, ever since the day of the fall, we've known that Satan's going to be defeated. We've known from the very... Uh, the, the very beginning when the fall took place that a seed of woman was going to come and he was going to claim victory. And from the days of Noah when he received that prophecy of the flood, he knew for 120 years that it was going to flood. So there's a difference, there's a distinction between something that's prophetic that was foretold versus something that was mystery hidden. If God uh, all of a sudden caused the flood. Yeah, that would not have been known, right? That would have been hidden. And uh, thank goodness he gave Noah some prep time because it took a little while to build the ark. Let's talk about another prophecy. In Genesis chapter 12, let's go ahead and read that. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. It's another prophecy that God gives. Give you a little bit of time. I made you go quite a ways there. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old, and he departed when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, I pronounced it two different ways that time. You can tell me which one is right. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the place of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. This prophecy is the first time that we see God deal with an individual man. Throughout, the, up to that point, it's really called the dispensation, the age of conscience and government. Man didn't have a, a, the Torah, the law, that Moses received on Sinai. Man was to do what is right. There was a, 
sacrificial system because you can read about it with Cain and Abel and throughout history. But at this point, God picked out a particular man named Abram. We know he's going to be changed to Abraham. And God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Your descendants are going to be my holy chosen people. And this land I'm going to give to you. That is prophecy. Make no mistake, the land of Israel, you can go to it today. That is the land that was promised to Abraham. It is rightfully the nation of Israel's. They are God's holy nation, and they are His chosen people. And, and it, it's Abraham's descendants, the Jewish people that God made this covenant with. And one day Israel will have that land, and Christ will reign as their king. These things have all been promised. It ultimately, the land does belong to them. Now, with that being said, we've established mystery concerns us, the body of Christ. What we've seen so far, prophecy has concerned the nation of Israel, Christ, uh, the, the defeat of Satan. Prophecy foretold those things. What we live in today, this age that we live in today, was not something previously known. It was not something foretold. As Paul said, it was hid in God from the foundation of the world. With that being said, God made very clear promises to the nation of Israel concerning the land, concerning their king, concerning all those things. So what is God doing with Israel today? That's an interesting question to ask because we know that we live in a mystery age, a dispensation of grace outside of the, the covenant of Israel. The most straightforward answer based upon Scripture, biblically, what God is doing today with Israel is nothing. At this time, Israel has rejected their Messiah. And because they rejected their Messiah, God made this opportunity for us today. Instead, He opened the door that He was going to offer eternal life, not, not an earthly kingdom, even though that earthly kingdom will come, but mine and your hope, what we look forward to, it's not heaven coming down to earth and, and there being a physical kingdom. We look forward to the day that when our time is up, we go to be with our Lord. We go to be with Christ. And we will get to enjoy eternal life with Him. That's what our hope is. Ours is a heavenly hope. It's not an earthly, physical hope. The kingdom promised to Israel is earthly. It is earthly. It is physical. It is these things. So, it almost seems as if God's forgotten about Israel. But I don't want you, but I don't want you to think that for a second. Not for one second has God forgotten or turned His back on His promises to the nation of Israel. He has made very clear promises to them that He will fulfill because our Lord keeps His word. Instead of God forgetting Israel, turning His back on them, He's placed the Israel program, the Messianic kingdom, the, the day when Christ will come and reign on the throne. He has placed a pause upon that. At some point in the future, these things will take place. But for the time being, God is not dealing directly with Israel. If you uh, are a Jewish person today, that gets you nowhere in standing with God because that is not the means by which we are reconciled unto God in today's time. In today's time, if you want to be reconciled to God, you have to trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for your sins and rising again. You cannot do it based upon who you are, who your dad is, who your granddad is, what, you, what works you've done, where you go to church, any of that. None of that matters. It's all by grace through faith in Christ. And this is because God put in place the mystery dispensation, the age that you and I live in. There was no prophecy of this mystery. It was not foretold previously. And whenever Israel rejected their Messiah, God instituted this 
unknown, previously hidden age that you and I have today. God postponed the Messianic kingdom because Israel rejected their rightful king. But once again, this dispensation that you and I live in, where God's not dealing with Israel, in no way negates what God has promised them. All those things are going to come true. So when, whenever we talk about the nation of Israel today, understand it's not Israel as we know in the Bible. It's not all the Jewish people that live there. There's a lot of Muslim people, Christians, that live in the nation of Israel. Israel is not a monarchy today as it was in the Bible um, and you could say certainly that they don't live by the law, um, even though some of the Orthodox Jews try to do the best they can. But if you don't have a temple, there's no, there's no way to keep the law fully as you're supposed to. But how should we stand concerning the nation of Israel? Here's my position to you. As a Bible believer someone who says, this is the Word of God and I trust it fully. There is no denying that the land of Canaan was promised to Abraham and his descendants. To this day, there are descendants of Abraham living on the earth. That is their rightful land. So as a Bible believer, I affirm wholly that Israel has the right to that land. Because the truth of it is, affirming that Standing for that is standing for the Bible. If we say they have no historical right to that land, they came in there and ran the people out that were originally living there. Besides, they don't even believe in Jesus anyways. That's really a rejection of a biblical worldview. If we truly believe the Word of God, we have to affirm, no, that land is rightfully theirs because God promised it to them. Now, that's not to say that in this age God is specifically ensuring Israel keeps the land. But one day they will. They will inhabit it forever. At least until the end of this earth. But in the meantime, as Christians, we need to affirm what the Bible says. We are going to stand on it. This is how we shape our worldview. And so therefore... I do say, as a Christian, we need to affirm they have the right to the land. No one else does. Um, the claims that that, is a, that was uh, traditionally, historically, Muslim land that the Jewish people came and took is incorrect. It is false. Uh, Islam came after Christianity, and Christianity is a result of the age that you and I live in today. Um, we know that the covenant with Israel was founded before that. So I reject all of those claims. The nation of Israel, the Jewish people, have a right to that land. But in today's time, a Jewish person has to come to God the same way that you and I do, by grace through faith in Christ. So what does that mean for us today? Us living in this mystery age, not concerning the nation of Israel. Well, for us, I want to give you a little bit of comfort we live in a time that was not prophesied of, that was not foreknown in previous ages. But the things that were foreknown, the tribulation was foretold. It's prophesied in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The Antichrist is prophesied in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The day of the Lord in which Christ will come and reign on the throne is Old Testament and New Testament prophecy. Now remember, we've been building this case, a biblical basis that... What's prophecy is prophecy, and what's mystery is mystery. You and I live in the mystery age. Israel is concerned with the prophecy. What we see in the world today is mystery age things. Therefore, I want you to maybe get a little bit better sleep at night. The things concerning the end times concern the nation of Israel. The tribulation, the Antichrist, all those things. The body of Christ is not a part of that. You and I are going to be raptured. And one of these days, I'm going to preach a whole sermon on that and, and build you a full case for that. But you and I are not going to live in those times. I don't want you to live in fear of us waking up tomorrow in the tribulation. The tribulation is not a part of the mystery. You and I live in the mystery age. So these things concerning... Whether it's the, the Antichrist, uh, 
whether it's, 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 the, it's the one world government, the order, all those things, this is concerning the nation of Israel. When the dispensation of grace comes to a close, and it will come to a close, one day you can no longer come to God by grace through faith alone. You will have to, in the words of Scripture, endure to the end, whether that is when Christ returns or the end of your life, because the tribulation will be that bad. And in that day, Israel will finally turn to the one that they pierce and proclaim that he is their Savior. So when this dispensation comes to an end, prophecy will begin to unfold. But in the meantime, don't live in fear or worry that the tribulation is going to start. Now, with that being said, I'm not saying that God can't be putting pieces in place on the board getting ready. But until our time is done, uh, Paul calls it the, the, the fullness of the Gentiles, until our time's up, those things are not going to be set in motion yet. So here's a simple rule to follow. <clears throat> don't look for the body of Christ in prophecy, and don't look for prophecy in the body of Christ. Because we live in mystery, a mystery age in which Israel, they live in the prophetic ages. So what are we to do in the meantime then? Here's my closing statement for you. It is always smart to keep a few extra green beans in your pantry. <laughs> Because you don't know what may come. Because I will say this, we may not live through the tribulation, but there is no guarantee that we will only see good times during this age. The mystery age that you and I live in can very well have hard times. We may face difficulty. So it's smart to be prepared. But at the same time, don't live in fear of the tribulation. That's not a program for us. That is an Israel program. And for you today, if you have not accepted the gift of salvation, please take it now because, like I said, pieces could be coming in place and so I don't know how long I'm going to be able to tell you this, but for this moment, you can come to Christ by grace through faith, not of works, and have the gift of eternal life. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer.